John Witt, man, thank you so much for doing this for us. Uh, I started doing this series of, it all started with Speedy. I just went over to Speedy shop and one day we just started shooting this shit like we always do. And I, right. I had the camera in my pocket and I set it down and he's usually pretty shy about that, but I just set it down and we just started talking. And I think I captured about 40 minutes worth of just our conversation. Right. And uh, oh, people loved it. And then it went on for months and I did nothing about anything else. And then uh, I decided to uh, ask uh, Jack Neary if he wanted mm -hmm. to do an interview. And he's like, yeah. And of course, oh my God, Jack Neary just so knowledgeable about it. And, and see, I'm not a bench rest shooter. So a lot of the stuff that he was saying, it was just mind blowing, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh so, yeah, man, you got uh, you got two guys uh, uh, with a whole pile of knowledge right there between those two. So then I decided, you know what? I need to do this with as many people as I can because I, I learned from Speedy, I learned from Jack, and then I talked to a few others and everybody I talked to, I kind of learned from them. So I thought, you know what? I need to expand to the other disciplines, you know? Give everybody some love, but in reality, to be honest with you, I'm, the whole point is for me and my viewers to, I'm sure they can get something out of everybody. So here you are. <laughs> Hey man, I'm I'm honored to be invited. I appreciate you taking time to uh, get in touch with me and everything. So, John Witten, uh, tell me how how did how did John Witten happen to be John Witten? I mean, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, Ben Eric, I guess the uh, you know the kind of quick hit the highlight story. I'm one of those guys that uh, has shot rifles competitively all my life, all the way back down to you know 4-H club, four position BB gun through high school, uh, three position air rifle, shot in college and stuff. And, uh, you know, graduated college, uh, moved back down uh, and, and kind of started running the family farm. And uh, after about a year and a half, I told my wife, I said, I miss competitive shooting. I want to pick up something and do it. And you know, that long range stuff sounds pretty neat to me. So, uh, so I gathered up all my, all my target shooting gear and an AR-15 that I had. And uh, I remember I went out and uh, paced off 600 yards in a field as best I could and put up a target and uh, got a zero. And April of 2000, I showed up at Riverbend Gun Club for the 600 yard match and kind of asked, hey, where do I sign up, you know? And uh, from there, I've just really enjoyed it uh, because I, you know, I've had certainly the, uh, the, the position shooting element of things, which I really like, and you know, shooting with sights and all that stuff. I really like all the technical side of it, both from the hand loading and ammunition part and the rifle side. And so, uh, so kind of down that slippery slope I started and, uh, you know, and, and here we are now. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it seems like everybody starts somewhere, right? And right. Uh, <clears throat> I yep. started, my first match with, was with a hunting rifle, uh -huh. um, you know, long range match, 300 wind mag off of Harris bipod. It did not go well. <laughs> <laughs> right what was your first match like? your hook nonetheless it did uh what was your first match like i mean were you uh because uh, you know i've talked to quite a few people now and uh it, it just one of my uh you know larry tate he said his first match ever with a 243 hunting rifle at 600 yards he shot mm -hmm. it clean and wow. he thought oh this this ain't that that bad you know what right, i mean right <laughs> Well, and, I didn't blow the top out of it or anything like that. If I recall right, I maybe shot in the 550 or 560 range out of 600 points. And, you know, I had some, I had some bright spots enough to encourage me to come back, but I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't just go out there and just wear out the field or anything <laughs> like that. Certainly, you know. So, uh, how long did it take? I mean, were you hooked after the first match or, or, or was it a, you know, what happened after the first one? Well, I, I'm gonna say I was I was hooked because, like I said, I, I enjoyed the you know the 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 shooting part. By that, I'm talking you know like the shot execution, the aiming, the using the sling and the spotting scope, you know, and all that kind of stuff that happens when you're literally laying right there on the firing line, uh -huh. you know. And and that was all good. And uh, and I've been a student of hand loading for a long time. Uh, man, I grew up loading shotgun shells from the time I was a kid with my dad, and then so you know that naturally progressed into rifle reloading and stuff like that. You know, years later. And so, uh, so I saw, you know, all the advantages of having better rifles and better ammunition. You know how it is when you, you know, when you get your stuff out, uh, you know, and, and, and when you get to the match and you're getting your gun and your gear out, 
you know, if your stuff's a little ahead of everybody else's, you're, you're ahead of everybody else before you start like that. So I, I right. got to, uh, you know, I got to see uh, the importance of that. You know, it was, it was reinforced to me, I guess I might say. And uh, so just kind of uh, just kind of went from there. And uh, really, you know, from that point, Eric, I, I shot um, I shot that summer with the AR-15 that I had and, and knew pretty early that I was going to stick with this and needed some better gear. I uh, had an AR-10 after that. And uh, this was long before our shop was around and we were building bolt guns and stuff like that. Uh, about a year later, I had a, you know, a really competitive bolt gun built. But the interesting thing is I, I felt like it took me three or four years on the ammunition side to really get the ammunition worked out. And, and what I mean by that is to get to the point to where I could load ammunition and get to the match and know when I took it out of the box that it was going to shoot well, you know, because, you know, as, as, as rookies, you know, I was like everybody else. I thought, man, if I weigh this powder out real carefully, you know, and, and, and you know maybe adjust the uh, adjust the jump on the bullet. I have this stuff dialed in, but as as you well know, uh, man, there's so many more elements from you know neck tension and and you know down to primer lots and all this kind of craziness. But it took me it took me some time to really get to where I could get all of my equipment out of the truck when I got to the match and and really feel like I was going to be competitive with it. It's it's amazing how many people are obsessed with getting the the powder charts down to the third decimal place. Yep. When in reality, that's not that critical. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but they don't know that. They don't know that. They 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 think. And I'm not saying don't do it. I you know I throw with the Prometheus, and and the reason I throw with the Prometheus is just it's so fast and it's so reliable and it's so accurate. Right. But uh, I made High Master Long Range High Master with the Charge Master. You know. Right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, at some point, they're gonna realize that that's not the most important thing. You know, <laughs> so to you, to you, how long did it take before you realized that, that, hey, you know, this, this, this perfect ammunition means nothing if I, if I'm slapping the trigger or if I'm right. doing all these other things? Well, you know, you, you make exactly the point there that, that, you know, besides the, the perfect ammunition means nothing when you've missed the wind call or, or slap the trigger or you've anticipated the shot and kind of shouldered the gun or something like that, you know, it, it doesn't make, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything, you know, at that point. Um, and, and, you know, to your point there, especially with us prone shooters shooting from the sling, you know, we've got some movement in the gun. We've got a little bit of uncertainty when we're aiming with iron sights, especially, you know, so we've even got a, a longer list of things that makes it so that the, um, you know, so the ammunition component is, I'm going to be frankly, it's a little less important than it is in F-class and Ventress, you know. So, uh, but you know, at the same time, you got to have stuff that's going to shoot well. You got to have stuff that's going to shoot, you know, better than your neighbor if you're going to, you know, if you want to plan to win at it. So, um, right. Well, I mean, I'm not saying it's not important, but what I'm saying is, it's uh, per precise or the most perfect ammunition is not the end all, right? You get it, right. it's part of the system. It, it needs to be done, right? It's that's just right. not. Yep. It's just not going to carry you all the way. It only matters. <laughs> everything has to be as good as possible right and yep. what i always tell people is nobody ever has a problem spending money on hardware right. but on software nobody wants to nobody wants to take the time to dry fire a few thousand times in their living room nobody wants to take the time to to uh read a wind reading book nobody wants to t take the time to to go out there and just sit out in the front yard with binoculars mm -hmm. or a spotting scope and and you know maybe watch the the cars go down the dirt road and see which way the wind blows or the dirt pop you know nobody does that but everybody right. wants to get <clears throat> oh I'm, there's a new scale coming out that that throws to three decimal places and and uh there's there's this other gadget and that gadget and uh, you know i'm gonna get a new scope and i'm gonna get a new barrel and and you know this that and the other all oh, this is new hot cartridge that's gonna right. come out but you know hardware and i'm if, if you go into my reloading room, I'm a hardware freak. But at some point, you have to update that software, yeah. which is what I'm hoping this, this does for a lot of people. That's right. So, yep, man, I'm completely with you on that. And, you know, kind of to your point there, Eric, um, you know, a lot of guys, we, we seem to think maybe it's a little too cool to talk about the mental side of shooting because, and, you know, I'm going to tell you, the, the last, um, before I won my first national championship, I really had uh, I really had to get over the mental side of it and get that part of it right. I had the equipment, 
you know, to do the job a couple of years before I, you know, before I was mentally ready to, uh, to do that. And, and that was, you know, that was the single biggest challenge and it's still a part that I like a whole lot, you know, in this stuff. And, you know, as I think, uh, maybe it's a thing that's, this maybe a little harder for men, or maybe, maybe I should just speak for myself. It's hard for me. You know, it, it's hard for us to admit that, uh, that we get nervous at matches, you know, but I don't know about you. I still get nervous at matches. Sometimes I still feel some tension and I, you know, we don't, we don't want that. We want to be relaxed and everything. And, you know, we can certainly talk about, like, for example, one concept that's very important. The only shot that matters is the next one that you're about to shoot. You know, if you if you shot a poor shot, the shot before, listen, that's in history. There's no need to dwell on it. There's no need to get mad about it and all that. But that's one of those things that's much easier to talk about than it is to actually do. At least it is for me. <clears throat> I've seen people throw a bad shot, just one bad shot which turns into a bad string, mm -hmm. which turns into a bad day, yep. which turns into a bad week, yep. and possibly in a bad season. You know what I mean? Just just yep. because that one shot, they just keep thinking about that shot, and they're so upset about that one shot that they pretty much throw everything else away because of the one shot. And I think, again, I'm gonna speak for myself on this one, but it's, it's, it's really easy. This is, you get pretty nervous. I, I still do, you know what I mean? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, it's pretty easy to, cause you know, that one bad shot mm -hmm. now that's, that's an excuse, right? That's a reason of why I shot bad, you know, right, a right. bad puller, you know, if you have a bad target puller, that's right. okay, there's, there's my excuse. <sighs> if I shoot bad now, I have someone to blame. You know what I mean? Right. And it's really hard to, now don't tell me, I mean, uh, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It's, they are legit reasons sometimes, but mm -hmm. I think in the back of our mind, sometimes we kind of just almost like let ourselves go because now we have a reason, you know, instead of just saying, you know what, I'm gonna overcome this. Um, for example, the first 600 score at long range that I ever saw, that I ever saw that I that had been shot as far, as far as I know was David Mann. Mm -hmm. He finishes his last string of the day. He had a 400. He went to the last one. He shot his 20 shots. He's clean. That's a 600. That's a perfect 600 at long range. Okay. Right. Um, and his scorekeeper missed two or three shots. Oh, wow. And he's done. <clears throat> right. He gets up and his guy's like, you you got three more shots to go. And he's like, no, I'm done. Look, look at it. Like, yeah, I don't care. You got it, and of course now he's he's amped up, right? He's upset. Right. The wind's doing whatever it's doing. I mean, he got up off the line, off the gun, you know, and he laid back down. He was upset, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, and he shot three more clean shots, right, for his six hundred. Yeah. So he had a perfect excuse. You know what yeah. I mean? That's right. But that that mental fortitude that it took. So I gave him more credit for that than for the 600. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a very challenging thing. You know, like you said, you know, you, you, he's interrupted his rhythm. He's had, you know, the challenges of being questioned and, and stuff, you know, and all that. And he, I, I'm sure he had enough fired brass. And like you said, you know, knew he had shot 20 shots for score and everything like and, that. But well, that's incredible that. to lay back down and, and just, you know, seal the deal like that. And not only that, he, he just shot his first six or the first 600 possibly in history in f class at long range. And now he's being denied of that, not because of his fault, fault right. at all. You know what right. I mean? Just because his uh, scorekeeper was distracted or whatever. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. And to find out that he has no choice but to shoot again. Right. And to lay down and, and, and put down three more center shots, you know, uh, no side or anything, you know. Right, right. That's incredible <laughs> so right there. That is an incredible uh, story. And, and David Mann is, as far as I know, one of the toughest competitors mentally I've ever met because of that right there told me this guy is tough. Yeah. And yeah. he is tough. So uh, here's, here's what I always ask people. Hmm? Or what I always tell people, because I teach reloading classes and, and, and things of that nature. And I always say, look, I can pretty much teach anybody how to shoot really good in about a year. You know, somebody who's dedicated, whatever, in, in about a year, some less, uh, I can shoot, I can teach anybody how to shoot. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Would you be able to, in, in one year, teach somebody how to shoot? 
I agree with that. And, uh, you know, I want to piggyback on something that you said earlier, that that dedication and uh, that time spent dry firing, that time spent, you know, plugged into an electronic trainer, if you use one of those, you know, which is, you know, fairly common for us position guys and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think somebody can get to where they're shooting some relatively competitive scores in that time if they're going to work on it. And now, now here's here's the here's the other question to that. The other half of that question, I guess. How long to teach somebody how to win? Years, more than just one. Exactly. So I tell people like, look, I can teach you how to, because they're like, oh man, I want to learn how to shoot like you. And I'm like, look, for one, I'm not that good of a shooter. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty good, but I said, uh, I can teach you how to shoot, you know, with the best of them. You know what I mean? Right. I said, but teaching you how to win is, because they're like, I want to learn how to shoot with, like you and I want to go win. I'm like, whoa, those are two different things. Right, right. And they're like, they don't go hand in hand. I said, they do not go hand in hand because yep. I've seen amounts, I mean, numbers and numbers of shooters that, you know, you go to a club match or you go to a practice and they just tearing it up. Mm-hmm. When yep. the big stage, when they're put on the big stage, it's hard. It's hard to win. So anyway, uh, yep. it's that's a whole another level to teach somebody how to win. Yeah, yep, it is. It is. So... Let me share this with you. This is one thing that, that I found kind of influential, you know, uh, at least in my shooting on this. Um, a lot of shooters are familiar with the uh, with the book With Winning in Mind by Lanny Basham. Uh, Lanny's probably, gosh, I guess he's probably the most famous mental management type coach for our type of shooting. And I'm going to paraphrase here. I'm going to I'm going to miss getting um, the words just as just as Mr. Lanny presents it and all that stuff. But one of Mr. Lanning's principles is he tells you, basically, you need to think that you're a little bit better than you are. In other words, and, uh, you know, so let's say, uh, let's say you're, you know, you've begun shooting and you're climbing the ladder. Maybe you're shooting, you know, master class scores or something like that. But, you know, you really, you have the goal of making high master, okay? Mr. Lanning uses the example of, you know, well, if I want to be a high master, I need to think and act like a high master. So if, I was already a high master shooter. What would I be doing? You know, both mentally, um, as as far as uh, you know, the mental program, as far as equipment, as far as you know, all those things. As far as what matches you'd be shooting and who you'd be hanging around and stuff. And and his point is, go ahead and adopt those principles today. And so, uh, so I think that's important. You know, that we all, as we're as we're trying to get better and do things better. You know, we think about, well, hey, if I want to be in this place and, you know, again, this example, maybe it's becoming high master or becoming a national champion or whatever, you know, whatever it might be. If I want to get to this place, what habits would a person have that has accomplished that goal? And how do I go ahead and start that right now? And, I, and that's that's been uh, that's been a useful principle to me. Yeah, absolutely. I have I've read that book a long time ago and I read it every now and then. It's it's an amazing book. Uh, it's again. I learned how to shoot really good, and then I just couldn't win. Right. You know, I'd go to club matches, and I'd do really good. But mm-hmm. then I'd go to the big stage, and all of a sudden, there was something, yeah. always. And I was just nervous, and, and, and then I, I, said, uh, I said, okay, I need to work on the mental game. And then I started reading books like, like that book, right. you know? And then there's, there's, uh, there's a million other books that you can read, but that is the first one that I read. Right. Uh, <clears throat> But here is the problem that I have with shooting sports. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm gonna say it. All right. You need this is I believe that 100 percent because that just puts you in a different mindset, right? However, mm-hmm. once you win, it's frowned upon for you to be jumping up and down and say I won, and you know to have a big celebration in the shooting sports, it's a little frowned upon. I'm gonna say big frowned upon, right? Right. So. Yeah. You kind of need to act like you're better than than you are, but then once you achieve it, you need to suppress it because. Right. So that's that's a problem that I have, to be honest with you. I think the winner should just get to celebrate however they see fit. Now you know there's always limits, but I think, I think, uh, I don't know. That, that's that's always the 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 thing I've always seen in shooting sports that everybody kind of wants. It's almost like. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, I do. As, as a matter of fact, you you bringing me back to something that I remember, um, Eric. I'm I'm on guess on this year, so give me a little bit of room here. But I I think it was about 2011, maybe it was 2009. 
And we were up at Camp Perry shooting the, uh, the Long Range National Championships, and everybody up there was excited because there was a small team from ESPN who was there to report on it. So we're mm-hmm. like, cool, you know, hey, man, shooting sports, finally going to get a little recognition. Maybe some good will come of this. And uh, one of the guys there sat me down on a bench after we shot one day, and one of the questions that he had for me, he says, look, he says, I don't really see a whole lot of emotion out here. And he, he asked exactly what you were saying. You know, when people win, they don't, you know, don't see anybody, you know, you know, pumping their fist even, or much less jumping up and down and all that stuff. And, and I kind of thought about it for a second and I thought, you know, and, and basically my answer to him was this, you know, we work really hard in this game to, to calm down because, you know, we need, you know, low heart rate and, and not moving the gun and, you know, all those things to be very, very calm. At least speaking for myself, you know, I'm excited when, you know, things happen well or win or do this or do that, whatever. But I, I frankly, I find it really hard just to turn that back on because I've worked so hard to uh, to be calm and sort of be the opposite end of that. And, and uh, you know, I don't I don't know that I'm not saying that you that you can't be excited. You can't be ready to pump your fist and all that kind of stuff. But it's sort of the opposite thing that we're trying to do when we're shooting. Yeah. Um, you know, so what what do you how do you feel about all that? I, I mean, I agree. I mean, you, you <laughs> the game is all about <clears throat> Excuse me. The game is all about staying calm, right? Mm-hmm. But I think, and again, I'm I'm a very. I mean, you can, you just look at my face and you know how I feel. I mean, I'm, uh-huh. my emotions are right there for everybody to see at all times. Right. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm. This is my nature. I'm always like, you know, up and going and and just excited and and laughing and that that's just my nature. And then when I have to shoot, I literally have to put myself. And, and another, just like a trance, you know, it's like, okay, yep. it's, it's game yep. time. You know what I mean? Yep, I understand. Uh, but at the same time, it's once I'm done shooting, uh, I, I just, I, I, I completely understand what you're saying. But at the same time, it's, I, think, I think because it's how it is, I think it is a little frowned upon when somebody pumps their chest. Yeah, which I, I don't think it should be, and I think I think the celebrations need to be bigger. It's right. just what I'm getting at. You know what I mean? It's yep. like people win the freaking national championship. That's a big deal. Absolutely. And it's like, yeah, you know, they they have the the dinner, and then they have the award ceremony, and then they have the price table, and this that, and then towards the end, if there might be about twenty thirty people left, because it's late and everybody wants to get on the road and then they finally bring out the national champion and hey good job and that's it here's a little plaque i just i just think man it's winning a national championship is a big deal and i don't think the celebration matches the accomplishment right i mean i you know i know we're not doing it for the celebration but i just think it needs to be it just be a bigger deal yeah yeah (laughs) Well, I agree with you. And, and two, let me tie this back into something else we talked about, a, a, you know, a few minutes ago. And, you know, it needs to be a bigger deal. And, and I want to tie this back into what we talked about, about, you know, how to win and, and talk about the pressure that we put on ourselves and stuff like that. You know, Eric, I, you know, I used to think about it as, as man, I'm going to the national championships. I'm I, like you said, I'm amped up and I'm excited. I'm looking to be here. And a lot of the pressure that I felt at a, at a match like that, was because I was thinking, man, I've been practicing all year for this. Think about all the effort, all the dry fire, all the rounds I've shot, you know, all these things that I've done to try to prepare for this. And man, I want to do well. And if I don't do well, it's another whole year before I get the chance to try it. So, so that I, you know, talking about the pressure and learning how to win, it's difficult for me to put that out of my mind. The pressure mostly comes from inside myself and it's thinking about, well, you know, I've worked this hard at it this year. And, I, and of course, we all want to see success because we've all, you know, we've all worked hard at it, spent a lot of money, done a lot of things, you know. So uh, so the main the main enemy I have and the main person putting pressure on John Whitten is John Whitten. Yeah, that's precisely the problem. Uh, you know, I was talking to uh, uh, Todd Hendricks, who just won the f Class Nationals, the mm-hmm. F-Open Nationals. And he said he's because he's he's been up there every year, second, third, second, third, second, third, second, third, and then finally he wins it this year. Mm-hmm. So when I interviewed him, I said, "What what uh 
like what changed like what and he said you know i was talking to john myers and he told me that just don't worry about it if it's gonna happen it's gonna happen if it's not gonna happen it's not gonna happen he right. goes so i i quit worrying about it yeah yeah <laughs> and it happened yeah. You know? yeah well you know i'm kind of the same way and and the way that i took some of that pressure off myself was to tell myself if you know hey here's my goal but it doesn't have to be this year. You know, if I want to win the national championships, it doesn't have to be this year. And, and that at least in my mind, you know, I know we all have little things and they probably seem funny to other people or ridiculous. You know, that probably seems ridiculous to other people for me to say that, but, but at least that's what worked in my head was to tell myself, you know, hey, I want to do this, but I don't have to do it right now. And so that was the thing that, you know, that, that released and, and lifted some of the pressure off my shoulders, you know? So, I, I've been asked many times about being a national champion. I'm, I've never won the nationals, right? I've come close, second, third. I don't think I, third, fourth, multiple times, mm -hmm. uh, but never won it. Mm -hmm. And uh, people have asked me, like, do you want to win the nationals? And I said, I'd be lying to you if I said I did. I said, because I'm not putting in the work. Yeah, everybody wants to win the nationals, I said, but I'm not putting in the work. And just thinking about the work that it takes that I have to put in, I just, I just don't. So I said, the times that I place well, it's just, I just gotten lucky. I said, but I haven't, I haven't really earned the national championship. It's, it's a lot of work. People don't realize how much work it takes to, to become a national champion, you know? Uh, and I just haven't put in the work. So for example, I really wanted to be a Texas state champion. To me, that because that's where I started. I, I wanted to be a Texas state champion. So I worked and 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 then I, I won my first one. And I was like, okay, pressure's gone, I won. Well then I go back the second year and I win it again. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh great. Well then the third year I'm like, I don't even wanna go. Like it, it, it got to the point where I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm way too busy, I, I really don't wanna go. And I said, but I guess I'm gonna go defend it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd go and just, just reluctantly, I would show up. And so I won it three years in a row. Nobody had ever done that. So I went three in a row. Right. Well, I'm like, well, might as well make it fourth in a row. So now the, 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 the goal changed, right? right. Now it wasn't right. about winning the Texas State Championship. It was like, let's see how many I can string together, right? So I put right. three together. So three years, I'm uh, Texas State Champion. The fourth year, I, I didn't win. I came in second and I blamed it on my target puller, okay? Mm -hmm. And I was 100% sure that's what did it. You know what I mean? Because right, uh, yeah. I lost seven points and eight shots. Oh, wow. And I finally stopped. I'm like, I'm done until I get, because they had paid pullers that, that year. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm done. I'm not shooting until they give me a different puller. From there on, the next 12 shots, I only dropped one point. Wow, right. And I, and I lost the championship by two points. Oh, wow. So, right. But guess what? It's all an excuse at that point. And I said, I need to come back next year and prove that I could have won. Mm -hmm. So that brought me back the next year. Right. And I'm like, I'm going to go and I need to win. Well, <laughs> I showed up and shot uh, the team match on Friday. And then I found out I had a a water in my ammo box at the bottom. And I had some ammo that wouldn't, wouldn't shoot and some that would just hit real low on the target and so my ammo was compromised mm -hmm. so i used my individual ammo for the team match right. well now i don't have enough ammo to shoot the whole match so i shoot saturday and i'm in second place after saturday and i'm like i'm here to prove that i can win this like right. this you know I'm, in, in my head i wasn't saying this to anybody this is just in my own head talk right. about yeah you know, things that we, we work, the goals or, or whatever. I just needed to prove to myself that that's what did it. Yep. So now I don't have enough ammo to shoot the next day. And I'm in Houston. That's three and a half hours from my house. So we're done shooting. And I drive home after the shoot. Three and a half hours home. I get home. I load more ammo. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I go to sleep about 11 p.m. I get up at 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. So I slept about two hours right. and I drove to Houston again, showed up, shot the match and I ended up, I was behind by two points, I think on day one and on day two, I ended up winning by eight points. 
Wow, man. And and and, and I said, okay, I'm done now. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. I just had to prove that to myself that yes, that was the because you know it's always I always tell people, look, it's always an excuse until you can prove that. Mm-hmm. And I just had to prove it to myself. This is the first time anybody's heard that, but I just had to prove it to myself that yeah. that yeah. I just I just knew I had it in me, and then I haven't been back uh, right. just because I'm like okay, and I'm probably gonna go back. Uh, I'm gonna make a little more time and, and just go back. Cause, you know I enjoy it, but it's it's mm-hmm. no longer about winning. It's just right. more about just going and hanging out with friends, you know. Yep. But so, <laughs> but. <laughs> But I've never put in the type of that kind of dedication for the nationals. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. So, how many times have you won the nationals? Uh, won five here in the U.S. and won the uh, the Queen's Prize, the National Queen's Prize in Australia in 2011. So, in my mind, that's six national championships, five of them here in the U.S. So, so, so take me through your first one. What what was the first one like? I mean, that's. Okay. That's the big one, I think. It, oh, absolutely. The, the first one was in 2007. And, uh, you know, the thing that you mentioned about, you know, finishing high, I had finished in second place both the previous two years, 2005 and 2006. And uh, I'm going to tell you, it's a long ride home when you're second place, you know. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So, it's a long ride home. And, uh, you know, 2000, 2000, I remember that 2005 was – uh, was the most painful to me because I at, at one time there late in the match I kind of had it and I let it get away mentally you know and uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken Norm Crawford won it that year congratulations to Norm and then the next year uh, I was second to Kent Reeve Kent shot a very good score that was a little shorter ride home because I didn't ever have it and lose it I kind of you know shot a shot a little bit better. Uh, through all that, but you know, you you learn a lot about yourself to to you know set a goal and almost get there. You know, I mean, I don't know about you, but growing up, I mean, I, I see this with my kids and a lot of kids, you know, and it's it's almost as easy as man. You just set the goal and say you want to do something, and you're going to get there. Well, you, you know, in the big pond, it didn't quite like that. You know, right. there are a lot of other people that have that have set big goals and also have a lot of skills and also you know going to work hard at it and, and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, so it's, it's not, uh, so it, it is challenging. It's challenging to me anyway, you know, but, uh, but I'm real proud of it. And, you know, the other thing I want to say, and just like you and, and talking about winning your state championships, um, anybody who's trying to climb the ladder, I want to encourage them because this work I find to be cumulative. And so it's, it's easier, you know, it's easier to accomplish these goals now because of all of those cumulative hours dry firing I've spent, because of all those cumulative bullets I've shot down range and stuff like that. So, you know, if you're climbing the ladder and it feels like, you know, maybe you're not getting, getting a, you know, to the next rung as fast as you want to, listen, it all builds up. So keep after it. Right. And, uh, I mean, don't be afraid to reach out to a mentor, you know, uh, there's always, regardless of what you think, there's always somebody that may know something more than you do or better, and, or maybe teach you something slightly different, you know? Right. Uh, I've been guilty of it, and, and I've helped people with, with that too, you know? I uh, I was watching somebody shoot, and uh, and I'm just watching them shoot, you know, and I'm watching them, and they're, uh, they bring their hand to the trigger, and there's F-class, and they just, they just slap it. You know, yeah. and sometimes their hand would hit the stock. Sometimes it wouldn't. And I go, right. I said, hey, you're better off. I know you don't want to touch the stock, but it, you're better off touching it and having control than having to sometimes hit it, sometimes not hit it. You know, I said, that's right. that's inconsistent right there. And he changed that and immediately his 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 groups or his vertical got tighter on target, even with an yeah. F, F class gun, F open gun. Right. Uh, but it's, it's sometimes video yourself when you shoot, mm-hmm. just, just set up a camera and video yourself and you're going to see, it's a whole another perspective when you look at yourself than when you're actually doing it. Cause you That's see right. all these things that you're doing wrong. Yep. Uh, Absolutely. That you know are wrong, but when you're doing them, you don't realize it. That's right. You know? yep. So, so, you know, you finally win your first championship. What was that like? Oh man, it was great. You know, it was. I was just as happy and just as excited as uh, as you you think. You know, you think anybody ought to be because uh, 
like I said, it was, you know, big goal to me anyway. And, uh, to, to get up there and, uh, and, and, and win that. And, uh, you know, the next year, I, I know what you're talking about. You know, I had a, I had a friend, you know, so when my first one and my friend asked me, a shooting friend, he's like, man, do you feel a lot of pressure to go back up there and win the second one? You know, where nobody could say, oh, that whipping boy got lucky or you know what I mean? <laughs> or whatever yeah. like that. Yeah. And I said, no, really, I don't, you know, I, I said, I don't really feel that, you know, I know, I know I did it once and, and I'm good. And, you know, by this time I'd kind of figured out that I needed to tell myself that it didn't have to be this year. You know what I mean? So, you know, I want to try to win a second one. And I look, I, I got lucky and I did win my second one back to back in 2008, you know, so, uh, so that, you know, that felt really good too. I mean, <laughs> if nothing else, I knew it wasn't a fluke anyway, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, how important in your game? Well, first of all, what, what kind of equipment do you guys use? Um, the equipment is of course, quite similar to what most of the F class guys are shooting. The rifles are, are lighter and the stocks are a lot different. You know, that's, that's probably the, the single biggest thing is the stocks. We have more adjustability and all because we're laying there with the sling attached to the rifle. And so, you know, we, we've got to touch the gun. We, we really don't, we really don't so much have the option to, you know, operate the trigger without having your gun on the pistol grip. I mean. In other words, when I'm in here in the sling, I've got a lot of pressure on my left hand, you know, on the forearm of the gun. I feel a lot of butt pressure, you know, against my shoulder. My head is laid down, uh, you know, real hard on the stock and also I've already got a lot of those pressures on the gun that you guys in F-Class get to eliminate, you know. Right. And so, you know, adding one more pressure of, you know, gripping the gripping the thing with my right hand on the pistol grip, you know, it's just it's just a it's just kind of another pressure. So, uh, so we've got, we've got that difference. Um, when we go to a match, typically we shoot about two thirds of the match with sights and about one third of it with scopes. Um, and I really like the iron sight part of the shooting. Uh, you know, from the, from the outside, a lot of folks think, man, you gotta have some, you know, super hawk vision to be able to do that. And that's not really so. If anybody's got, you know, vision that's, that could be corrected back pretty close to 2020, they could probably shoot a real competitive score with it, you know? Uh, but to, to your point about excuses, a lot of times we let those iron sights be an excuse, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but that's, you know, otherwise we're shooting, uh, we, we have a jacket on and a sling attached to the rifle. Those are going to support, take up some of the weight of the rifle. Um, and, uh, so, so those are, those are the major differences, uh, in, in, in what we're using versus, you know, an F-class or Ventress type rifle. So, so uh, you've been using a 243 or have you? Changed, gotten away from that. No, I'm still shooting the old 243. Uh, I really like the light recoil, and I like it because I find that I execute good quality shots. Uh, you know, when that gun's not fixing a whale on me when I pull the trigger, um, I just find that I that I point the shots better. Um, and I, I do this better with the 243 than I did back when I was shooting a 6.5 284. Uh, before I shot the 6.5 284, I shot a 300 Winchester short mag. And you know, got really good accuracy with with all those guns, but you know, especially the the 300 Winchester short mag, I couldn't shoot it well all the times. And so, so I guess there are two of me. There's one of me that can stand the recall and has no problem with it, and there's the other one of me that cannot stand the recall. And the problem is, I don't know which one's coming to the match on any given day. <laughs> <laughs> that is a big issue. Uh, you just never know. So I, I tried a 300 for a while, and mm -hmm. even in F-Class, where we have the rest and all that good stuff. Uh, the whole setup, you shoot, and the, the, you know, the rifle wants to torque out of the bag, and it just bounces, and then you, you, know, you look down, and you're two, three targets over. Just, just That in itself is, makes it hard to shoot the 300, at least in F-Class, right? Now, you can spend a lot of time working on it, get it all figured out, and a lot of guys have. But that's just something that I didn't want to uh, spend the time doing because, you know, I did the math in my own head. It wasn't very scientific, but I thought, you know what? The 300 short mag helps me whenever I make a mistake. That's the only mm -hmm. time it helps me. Right. If I'm dead on and if I've got the wind dial then, it doesn't matter what I shoot. It's going to go where it's, it's going to go in the center because I got it dialed in. But if I make a mistake, then you know, the, the mistake uh, is going to be less with a 300 than it is with a 284, for example, right? right? 
right. But then I realized, well, when do I need a 300? When does a 300 come in handy? Well, it comes in handy when it's super windy. Right. And switchy. Windy doesn't matter. Right. Switchy. Right. Windy and switchy. Right. And I thought, well, that's about 10% of the time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm taking 100% of the punishment. I call it punishment. It's not hurting me, but it's, it's everything that goes with it. Yeah. 100% for only a 10% gain, it's just not worth it. I'm just going right. to stick to one rifle and shoot that all the time. And then... Uh, Whenever it gets windy or, or it gets switchy, this is, <laughs> this is what I always tell people when they're always like, well, what do you think about getting a bigger rifle? And I said, look, you don't need a bigger rifle. You need bigger balls. Because <laughs> when a smaller right. rifle, if instead of moving one ring, you got to move two rings. That's right. Or three. You know, and that's, that just takes a lot more courage. And people know what to do. But... They get scared once they start moving past the one ring. For some reason, that one ring seems fairly safe for everybody. And I think the reason is because, you know, you'll hit a nine if you're off. Mm-hmm. But every time you start getting to the eight territory, people really start to get frightened. And mm-hmm. they just don't push out as, as much. And guess what? They shoot a, they shoot an eight down win anyway, you know? Right. Yep. But I tell them, I said, you just, just need to... Grow yeah. a big pair and then just hang it out there, you know. Uh, in Canada, the last string of the World Championship, uh, I was moving two or three rings at a time. This right. way and that way. And if I was wrong, I was hitting a, a two or three. It was international. So, you know, mm-hmm. equivalent about a seven mm-hmm. if I was wrong. But I'm right. like, you know what? I got nothing to lose. I'm in 19th place. Who? Nobody remembers 19th place. 19th or 30th it doesn't matter right and i just went for it i mean i was because it was pair fire so i would shoot and then i had to wait for them to shoot and then i'd have to shoot again and i I mean i'd see the flags you know either Mm -hmm. here or here whatever and i'm like well uh somehow in my head i worked it out that i was always a ring behind Uh uh-huh and i thought you know what that's two rings i'm gonna add the ring that i'm always off uh-huh. And uh-huh. then I just started adding it. And then guess what? All of a sudden they start hitting in the center. Right. And then right. I just I just kept thinking in my head, okay, that's that's one ring. I'm gonna give it two. And then on the last string of the day I started adding that that half MOA that was coming out of somewhere. Right. And it worked out. I only dropped three points on the last one. Right. And uh I remember clearly on the very last shot I thought, okay, I'm only down two points. Mm-hmm. that's pretty good that's really good because the guy that i was shooting with he was down like 12 or 13 right yeah and i'm like wow i'm only down two points and then i make a call and i'm like you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna just play this one safe and all of a sudden instead of playing to win i started playing not to lose uh-huh and i shot a, i shot a four on my last shot because i didn't give it that extra half a ring that I, right. I, all of a sudden right. i started trying to protect my points Right. But luckily, the, the next place up above me, he beat me by two points. So that one point didn't really matter. But it's amazing how how much mental goes into shooting a match. There is. Yep. I got a, I got a story that I was thinking of the whole time you were telling that. And uh, there's a gentleman, Mr. Billy Atkins. Mr. Billy is a, is a, a super accomplished shooter in our world. And when you go shoot the NRA National Championships... If you shoot all the way through it with a service rifle, you're shooting for the Billy Atkins trophy. So this okay. is a big, beautiful trophy. Um, like I said, Mr. Billy, a uh, uh, longtime Army Reserve shooter and a very accomplished guy. And I had the pleasure to uh, to shoot under his coaching one time, uh, you know, kind of under some practice. And so I pulled my gun out and um, I was uh, I was not real good about turning, you know, sights back to no win zero and stuff at the time. So I laid down and I shot a shot and it's like a mid-ring eight or something like that. And Mr. Billy says, uh, he says, well, you know, what are you going to do about it? You know, basically is what he is, is what he's asking me. And I gave him some old excuse about, oh, well, you know, guns, cold, first shot, cold war, blah, you know, some kind of blah, 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 excuse like that. And I never will forget. Mr. Billy looks at me and he says, let me tell you something. He said an eight out one side counts just as much as an eight out the other side. Yeah. <laughs> so. So I said, yes, sir. You know, I reached up and put the correction on. And, and, you know, I kept thinking about that as you were talking, Eric, you know, whether you're 
whether you're under doping the conditions or whatever, hey, an eight out one side counts the same amount of points as an eight out the other. I've seen people, okay, forget I've seen people, I've done it myself. I've hit three nines downwind because mm -hmm. I'm afraid to shoot one upwind. Yep. You know yep. what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know when you get behind the wind. And oh, I do. Two to nine. And then you're like, okay, I, I was one MOA off, right? And then you put that one MOA on. But the wind, but you forgot to add how much the wind has built from the time you shot the nine till now. Yep. And then you hit, an, you shoot another one and it puts a nine right on top of that other nine. Yeah. And then you add another MOA or half MOA, whatever. But you, again, you don't compensate for, for the time that has passed and how much the wind has built. Mm -hmm. And you put another nine there because you don't want to, sh you're afraid to shoot one on the other side. That's right. And, That's and right. I've done it. I've done it. It's like put three. Three nines downwind because I don't want to put one upwind. And yeah. nowadays, I I have a different approach. Like I have automatic things that I do, and it's just once I built that into my mind, it's like this is if this then that. If I hit a nine downwind, it's automatic two lines, which is a full MOA upwind. Right. Right. And if I'm gonna shoot another one, it better be upwind. At least I can book in my my call, and now I can center it. You know. Right. But I used to always go half a line or or one line, and then just keep leaking them downwind, downwind. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So what? Wind reading for you guys? You guys don't hold off. You guys dial everything, right? When sights. Really speaking, if we're if we're shooting sights, we're pretty much holding everything. Um, there are a few people that will practice. We refer to it as shading, um, but it's really hard to shade outside of like maybe one minute of angle left or right of center. You know, it just, you, you just, it's very difficult to do. And, and like I said, very few of us practice shading at all. Now with a scope, uh, typically a guy, uh, most of us will kind of get centered up during the cider period and then we'll hold off, you know, scoring rings just exactly like you're talking about. Uh, but with the sights, yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty much uh, you got to dial a number on there and, and shoot it straight in the target, more or less. Um, now, I will do a little bit of shading with sights on days like you were talking about, days when it's switchy and the switches are coming real quickly because, um, you know, maybe it's a situation where it's happening fast and uh, maybe getting a good shot off in good time is more important than getting an excellent shot off but taking a lot of time to do it, you know. And in that case, I may, uh, you know, I may point the shot, you know, half minute right, half minute left, three quarters right, three quarters left, or whatever. But, but, uh, but no, I, I haven't ever practiced holding, say, you know, two minutes out of center and looking at it through the sides. What up? Uh, so, for you guys, I mean, it is no secret that the best or most of the top wind coaches in F class have come from sling shooting. You know, you have Trudy Faye, Michelle Gallagher, Nancy Tompkins, Mitt Tompkins, uh, Ken Reeve. He's done a little. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, who's this other one? Uh, anyway, uh, we have all these these uh, sling shooters that come over to F class, and they 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 just become coaches automatically because. Mm -hmm. You guys understand the wind better. What is it that you guys do? What exercises or what is it that you guys do to read the wind that we don't do? You know, because we let the gun do most of the talking. Right, right. <laughs> and you right. guys do the, Bob Mead, you know what I mean? You yeah, have all yeah. these guys um, that are uh, just, what is it that you guys do? How do you, how do you practice wind reading? What, you know, how do you guys no. approach that? You've, you know, that's a, that's a super question and I haven't really thought about it quite in those terms. So I appreciate it. You got my mind rolling, you know, kind of one of the first things that comes to my mind is, um, you know, no matter who you are in sling shooting, your group is going to be bigger than your typical F class shooter. You know, y'all, y'all have the equipment and everything to shoot smaller groups than we have. And so, so Eric, I guess the thing that I might point out is, we're having to center up a bigger group. Um, in other words, we have some element of, man, the shot looked like it went here, but you know, there's a little bit of uncertainty in it, quite frankly, and especially more uncertainty when we're shooting sights, you know, a little, little less so when we're shooting scopes. But, but 
those folks you you named are all excellent WAN readers, but they're also excellent at centering the group somehow. And maybe we get more practice at it because our group is just it's just flat going to be larger. And especially we're going to have more flyers. You know, we're going to have man. You know, I thought it broke good, but it really didn't. You know, uh, and that shot is is a lot further from the center than it's going to be for you know for an F class shooter. So. So I, I, I think I might answer that, um, that what you may be seeing is, is better uh, capabilities from those guys that centering up the whole group. Well, no, let me tell you what I'm seeing. <laughs> I'm seeing this. Okay, uh, we're going to stop because the wind's doing X, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I mean, the wind's just freaking raton type wind, you know, right. where it's whatever, dust devils going, rolling across tumbleweeds, and they're like, we're going to stop. <laughs> And, you know, the ones that didn't stop, they're blowing eights and sevens out the side. You know what I mean? And we're talking big right. guns. You know what I mean? And they say, yeah, we're going to stop, right? right? And then they stop, they stop. And the wind's just, the flags are just crazy. And, you know, and then Trudy will say something like, and she's just there talking, whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, typical Trudy. And then she'll be like, okay, we'll start getting ready. You know, we're going to, we're going to go at it it's not gonna slow down we're just gonna go at it right and let's say we're let's say we're holding center you know she's like okay well uh let's go right four like she'll make a two moa mm -hmm. correction or whatever mm -hmm. you know or a right five or whatever like like a drastic different right different call than we we have been shooting yeah. and they she will make that call with the most confidence you have ever seen. Yep. And then you're like, okay. You aim over there, you let it rip, and boom, it pinwheels the X-ring. And I'm right. like, <laughs> what? What did you see? Like, what are you looking at? You know, because, I mean, right. I can make pretty similar calls, but not in the conditions that she can make those calls. You know what right. I mean? And right. I'm going, you know, Michelle, Nancy, I've seen Nancy in... in, in and Nancy was my first coach ever to actually actually coach me. The first person at a U.S. tryout to to coach me, but just for tryout was Bob Mead. Mm -hmm. The first person that actually coached me in a match was Nancy Tompkins. Mm -hmm. And we're in Ireland, and I lay down, and she, and you know, Nancy, she's like, "Hi, honey, how you doing? Yeah. Just let me know when you're ready." And you know, and she's over here laughing, whatever. And then I get ready, and she's like, "Okay, honey, give me." Seven minutes on the gun. Seven minutes? She goes, yeah, seven minutes. It's windy out there, honey. I'm like, okay. Yeah. And I yeah. mean, the flags are doing this. And right. So I roll seven minutes on the gun. And she's like, all right, give me right four, some crap like that. Some just, okay, boom, center. And I'm like, right. how? You know what I'm saying? It's like, what? what are they doing? I'll give you another one about, about, about Nancy. We're in Raton, and uh, this was in Ireland. Now we're back in Raton, and we're shooting. She's coaching me. And uh, we're just, it's building, and she's just pushing me farther out, farther out, farther out, mm -hmm. farther out. And she's like, honey, you got a problem holding off the frame? I'm like, nope, okay. She's like, give me about six inches off the frame. Okay, and I'm off the frame. And, you know, we're hitting center. And she's like, oh, give me, a, give me about a foot now. And I'm holding, just estimating about a foot right. off the frame. And I mean, we're hitting tens and X's, right? And she's like, oh, we're going to have to push out more. She goes, does your scope track pretty well? And I go, as far as I know, she's like, okay, uh, give me like three minutes on the gun. Okay. And I just, she stops in the middle of this madness. And I roll three minutes of wind on the gun. And she's like, okay, now hold left four or something like that. Boom, 10 or an X. And she's like, ha, ha, ha. I love it when that happens. I mean, and I'm, I'm, right. just, I'm just there going, wow. Right. But, you know, I'm just, and now, I'm, I, you know, the pressure's increasing on me to give her a good, a good shot because she's just killing the wind calls. Oh, yeah. And I'm, I'm just wondering how. How does this, because, again, if it was one person, but mm -hmm. it seems to be, a pretty unanimous thing that when uh, when readers come from sling shooting so what is it 
<laughs> what is well, it? Let me, let me, let me tell you another quick story. So, um, I, I've been shooting long range, uh, like I told you, I started in 2000 and, uh, I wanted to go attend the trials for, it would have been the 2003 Palma team. So this was like fall, I guess this was fall of 2002 up at Butner, North Carolina. And went up there and I've been pointing good shots, but really had no real wind reading experience, you know, or knowledge or anything like that. And I go up there and I'm just getting crushed, man. I'm just getting blown. Um, man, I could have solved the target in half. You know, the elevation was good. And I'm just, you know, I'm just going from one side of the target to the other the whole week up there. I spoke with a gentleman, Mr. Bob Jensen. And Bob was one of Mid Tompkins' old friends that traveled and shot with Mid for many, many years. And he says, listen, he said, to, to summarize what he said, he said, you got to look down there at the wind and you come up with a number and you put that number on the gun and that's, and that's what you shoot. And, and so, uh, so I kind of, I said, well, you know, I need to listen to Mr. Bob here, but Eric, I gotta be honest. It really didn't sink in. And so a year and a half or so later during that same trip, when I mentioned I was shooting with Mr. Billy Atkins, Mr. Billy sat at the dinner table and he told me like word for word, it was like a replay of the conversation that, that Mr. Bob Jensen had told me. And I thought to myself, boy, you were dumb to miss that the first time. You'll be really dumb not to take this advice hearing it from two of these legends like this. So Eric, the, the summary of, of what all of those people you're mentioning are, are doing, or at least it, it all comes back to this, all the Palma shooters I've met who are, who are super successful, both US shooters and, and overseas shooters. Eric, at the end of the day, they're looking down there at, at, at the conditions at what they can gather, you know, flags, mirage, kind of all of it, you know, and they're attempting to put to assign a number to that picture. And, uh, and I, I, I think of it a lot like um, when you, the old memory card game, when you got cards laid out in front of you and you turn the card over, you know, and you're matching a card up with a condition. And so they're looking at, uh, at these conditions and this mirage and assigning these numbers. And so for myself, I can remember about three conditions. In other words, I might look at one and, uh, and I'm thinking, man, that's uh, maybe that's like what three minutes looks like, I think. And then, uh, you know, I look at a, at a stronger condition. I'm like, man, I think that's maybe five and a half. And then I got one other picture for something, you know, in the middle of those two. So maybe I, maybe I got like three and a half, four, and then five and a half. Well, once I've gotten, you know, two or three of those pictures, then I can usually kind of guess in between, you know, if you know what three and a half looks like, and you know what five and a half looks like, you can probably guess four and a half minutes. But, but anyway, to, to kind of roll up the, the answer to your question, uh, the thing I see all of those shooters that you're, that you're mentioning doing all those really, really excellent wind readers, um, all of those people are looking down range at a condition and they are assigning a value to it, you know, in, in minutes of angle. Okay. Uh, I've over the years learned to do that, not that, but for example, I'll, I'll stand at the range and I'll look down range, you know, I'll lay down, get behind the scope and I'll be like, that's three right, three rings, which is, mm -hmm. I automatically assign a value based on rings, which is three rings is one MOA, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and then as I go, I always ask myself before I take the shot, I go, is that more or less or the same? You know, mm -hmm. back to that picture. And mm -hmm. I don't use a spotting scope. And the reason I don't like to use a spotting scope is I, I stay down on my rifle. I shoot, I'm always looking to the scope. I throw a round in there and I try not to, not to ever get off the scope because I like to see what I call a movie, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. if, if, kind of like the flashcards. Uh, that's how the magicians get you, right? Because they, they do something real fast. And I'm afraid that when I take my focus off of there and I come back, it changed, but I didn't pick it up. Whereas if you're looking at it like the whole time, I can see it slow down or pick up or whatever. It, at least it helps me. And before I break the shot, I always go, is that more or less or the same? Mm -hmm. And I remember my last hold, right? And then I just operate off of that. Mm -hmm. For me, yep. if I can see it, I automatically say that's at least half MOA if I can right. see it. I automatically right. give it half MOA value and then I just move a ring. I never move right. less than a ring. And I've always told people in F class, I'm look, look, well, when I teach classes, I go, look, if you see it, it's one ring. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're going to shoot a lot of leakers out. So if you see it, move one ring, because even if you're absolutely wrong 
and then you mm -hmm. center it up, one ring is half MOA. The target's ten. Uh, it's one MOA. I said, if your right. gun is shooting perfectly, then you should still clip the line. Right. Technically, you're still safe. I said, but if you ever see it, it should push you in anyway. So that's your, your safe mm -hmm. side. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's kind of how I... But I do what I call relative wind reading, right? I base my current call on the previous one and the previous one, and I just base off the previous call. But what I'm talking about, Trudy and and Nancy and all them, is like they can just sit there. <laughs> and I guess that's... Yeah. They have, like you said, this picture in their head, yeah, or multiple pictures, and they already know right. yeah. what it's worth. Okay. Yeah, it's it's interesting you pull that word relative out and use it, you know, um, because that's exactly what it is. You know, uh, just you know, in machining, there's relative coordinate systems and absolute coordinate systems. Mm -hmm. Well, wind reading is the same. You know, there's you know, you may be working off the relative coordinate system, but uh, because of uh, Trudy's experience and everything. She has a very good absolute coordinate system. Right. And she's also thinking of each shot in absolute terms. And, and you know, again, just to kind of hit this, you know, um, uh, to, to use the example, you know, maybe you got a base hold and man, I, you know, I think my most of my shots are going to be on the three ring or whatever like that, you know, is it higher or lower? Trudy and Trudy's mind may be looking at is that three ring or is it four ring? You know, as opposed to, well, that's the, you know, I need a little more, need a little less. And, uh, and, and I, I see, you know, I see how folks really build a lot of experience working on, you know, kind of that, that absolute wind reading system like that of assigning an absolute number to what they're seeing. The problem with the absolute is it's only good for one cartridge. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah because, um, because let's say your absolute wind call. Now, this is the reason I don't like changing cartridges, okay? Because mm -hmm. even my relative wind calls, everything <laughs> is relative, right? Right, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, for, for and, and, and I think, yes, I think they have an absolute value to the wind that they work off of, where I'm relative, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but they also know how to convert it for different cartridges. You know what I mean? Right. Yep. And I think I think once you work off the absolute, you can add or subtract depending on what you're shooting. You know, right. there's just yeah. a lot more. They're just a lot more technical, which I think right. makes them better. Yeah. Uh, but the reason I'm able to uh, do sometimes better than them is because I take advantage. I play the game. You know, if it was an absolute game about wind reading, yeah, they would win. But mm -hmm. I shoot fast, and as long as I don't lose lose my relative call, mm -hmm. I'm in there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But right. it, it, my point is, it's amazing what they do. It, it's and yeah. I know they I know they don't do it the way I do it because I go how how the heck <laughs> if I go oh I know what they're doing and this is why I wanted to ask you that because I I've I've, uh, I've never been able to ask anyone that question mm -hmm. and until now where but yeah that that makes absolute sense. Let me let me give you one more piece of it here, and, and uh, maybe I should do this kind of through example. So so let's say I'm standing back, getting ready to shoot. You know, I hadn't been called to the firing line yet, and and you know, stand back there. We watch these conditions, and uh, you know, we're looking at the flags and the things downrange. And and so when I go to the firing line, I've probably got you know, uh, on my best days, I've got two numbers in mind. Like, hey, I, this is the slowest condition, and I think it's going to be three minutes of angle, and, and this is the highest condition, you know, flags are standing out more, and I think that's going to be five minutes of angle. What I try to do during, during the ciders, and, and this kind of puts together what you're talking about, you know, absolute, well, that's really only good for one cartridge, um, you know, with what's happening that day. So, so Eric, so I go to the line, and I'm thinking I'm going to shoot a cider in the minimum win, I'm going to shoot it at three minutes, I'm going to shoot a cider in the maximum win, and shoot it at five minutes. Well, you know, so I shoot my cider in the minimum wind and, you know, I was guessing three minutes, but it was really only worth two and a half, you know? So in my mind, I'm, I'm taking that picture, you know, that mental image and I'm assigning it. Okay. I thought it was three. That's really two and a half today, you know, regardless of, you know, gun, climatic conditions, you know, whatever, whatever. And then I'll shoot the other cider, you know, if I can in the high wind and I, man, I think it's, I think it's going to be worth four or excuse me. I meant to say in the example, I, I think it's going to be worth five. Well, you know, I shoot that shot. And maybe it's only worth four and a half. And so, whereas I thought I was going to go to the line and shoot in a bracket of three to five, I'm actually going to shoot in a bracket of two and a half to four and a half. 
And so, um, so that's kind of a, a tool I think that can be used uh, to sort of bridge the gap into thinking like you're, you know, just exactly like you're describing right there. You know, uh, we, we, we go, we, we put those ciders to use um, with maybe what we expect to shoot and we fine tune those numbers into what I'm really going to shoot. You know, so all those little things like differences in cartridges or, you know, maybe Eric shows up and Eric's guns, Eric's no win zero is a little different from mine. I'm shooting the side and you know what I mean? You kind of, you kind of roll all those differences up um, and, and you, you know, the idea of course is to do that in the cider period. Yeah, and they compensate off because they're also really good at, now that you mentioned that, they're really good at, they say, here, give me a right three, Let's, you know, first shot, Let's take a cider at right three, boom. Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, okay, uh, your, your wind zero is half a minute off, yeah. put half a yeah. minute on there, and then boom, and all of a sudden, they marry all of our guns, you know what I mean? Right. And they're, you know... It's it's amazing to see them do what they do. Uh, so you mentioned uh, earlier centering the group. Mm -hmm. uh, I always, when I'm shooting, I'm always doing what I call safety clicking. Mm -hmm. If I'm even if I'm hugging the top of the X ring, I put a click down because I want to be as perfectly centered. And sometimes if I'm making my wind calls, because I make my wind calls when I'm holding off, typically in one, actually in half ring increments. I don't ever do quarter rings. I do half rings. Right. And if I start always seeing that I'm hitting either liner X's or liner, you know, liner tens on the right or the left, rather rather than change my wind holds, I just put in I literally click my my windage to get centered. Mm -hmm. That way I don't have to change my wind calls. Right. So I'm always because of that book, I, I don't know which book it was that I read about centering your group. Um, I'm always trying to center my group. And because of that, I have shot some really, really ugly cleans. Yeah. But they've been clean because they yeah. just hug oh, that, yeah. that 10 ring all low, and it's they are so ugly, John, but yeah. they're cleans, you know. Oh, I know what you mean. It looks like a donut <laughs> down there, you know. <laughs> yep. So, no, I completely agree. And go ahead. So shooters get into the game what exercise would you say that they probably need to do what is it that they need to do to get better become a better wind reader um i would say number one be thinking in in the absolute terms on the wind and and when you go to the firing line especially when you're going you know to shoot your ciders don't just go up there and just pull the trigger on one and see where it goes and then go from there listen that's not much effort Stand back, you know, do your best homework, look at the flags, look at the wind, measure it with your wind meter, work math, whatever system you want, but go to the line with a plan and, and have that plan as refined as you can and, and then test it in the cider period and use those ciders, you know, to refine your plan. And that's where you're going to get that real education and, you know, kind of going back to that example I was using, you know, if you, if you think you're going to need three minutes of angle in this wind, you get up there and you only need two and a half, you know, you've learned something, but that's, that's better. You, you're already ahead of the game as opposed to just, man, I'm going to go up there and just, you know, point at a couple of rings upwind and pull the trigger and see what happens. You know, that's not really making your best effort at it. So, uh, so, so go to the line with a plan and, uh, and, and think of it, especially those first cider shots in absolute terms. I would say if I had to just give one single piece of advice, that'd probably be it for wind reading. So, um, one thing that I told people when I teach classes, I go, look, this is how you, how I suggest that they learn how to read wind. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody wants to right away go and start compensating, holding off. Mm -hmm. And I said, that, that, that makes it harder to, at least for me. So I said, the first question you should ask yourself is like, is it going right or left? Because mm -hmm. sometimes, as you know, it's hard to tell. Right. Most of the time, like, oh, that's obvious, you know. But sometimes when it's kind of doing this weird stuff, mm -hmm. you, you really can't tell. So, but either way, I said, first, you need to decide to go right or left, mm -hmm. number one. I said, and that's your first exercise. And you hold dead center on the target and mm -hmm. you pull the trigger. Of course, you got to have a good wind zero, right? Right. Uh, establish a good zero at 100 yards and then go from there, you know. Work, work in. If you're doing 600 yards, work in your... Uh, your spin drift, right? But right. either way, hold that center on the target and say you're going to go right or left. And then just 
shoot, see where it goes. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. And then just wait five, ten minutes for the wind to change. I said, okay, now what? Where's it going to go? Well, it's going to go, I think it'll go left now. Hold dead center and see where it goes. You know, and now you start to develop these pictures that you're talking about in your head, right? Right. And then you start to recognize because sometimes you're going to be wrong. Right? It's going to go right, and then it goes left, and then you, and then now you have time to study that. Right. What made it do that? What made it do that? And then you start looking, maybe adjust your scope back and forth, and mm -hmm. just find the reason that it did that. Right. Mm -hmm. At some point, uh, you know, let's say the wind's coming from the left, and now you start going. Well, I think that's going to be, I think that's a one MOA wind. Mm -hmm. Hold dead center, and see how far the shot drifts. You know, don't right. automatically go and try to hold off an MOA because if you hold off an MOA but you missed by well, half MOA, you're like, well, that's one and a half. Somehow it doesn't register, at least in my mind. Mm -hmm. However, you always hold center mm -hmm. and then you just track how far it went. And then mm -hmm. at some point, you're going to start to recognize these winds, right? These mm -hmm. pictures. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to be like, well, that's going to be two MOA. You hold it center, it moves two MOA. You're like, got it. Right. It doesn't matter right. that it's out there. It, it's it's you're you're not practicing that. You're practicing wind reading, right? That's At right. some point, when you get all this wrapped up, then you start holding off. What is that? That's two MOA. Fine. I'm gonna hold two MOA here. Get mm -hmm. it in the center. Mm -hmm. You know. Now, wind versus uh, wind flags versus mirage for you. Mm -hmm. What are which one are you? Or are you well, both? I use both. Um, and and some of this depends on the range that I'm at. Uh, but, you know, down here in South Georgia, we have a, a lot of trees and stuff. And so we we most often will see switchy winds, relatively low velocities, but they change often. It, it's not unusual for us to be, you know, doing something to the side or holding a different place on the target or whatever. Every single shot or at least, you know, every two shots. Um, unlike, say, out in Phoenix, where we might shoot, you know, half the string of fire with the same setting or something like that. You know, I've been in in very calm conditions out west. So. So terrain dictates a little of that, but in the in the relatively lower velocity wind, a lot of times we find mirage to be very useful down here because it seems to show the changes very quickly. And uh, you know another thing that I'll mention, Eric, too, is is uh, you know how useful the flags are depends a little bit on the on the terrain around the range. Like for example, you know you may have flags, but they may be blocked by trees, or at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. You have flags, but you're shooting across a big valley, and the flags are quite quite a bit below the the line of flight of the bullet. So, so you kind of have to take some of those considerations um, into it uh, into it too. So, uh, so one of the things I do before I shoot a match, you know, if I if I get a chance, I'll stand on the firing line, and I may try to identify those things, you know, or or sort of. Um, Give them a certain weight in my mind. Um, in other words, to take the the example at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, you know, for for an example, there's a flag down there at 600 yards, but that thing, man, it's probably 20 feet below line of sight, easy, you know, or more. So I stand there and I know, well, that flag's probably not going to be all that useful to me, you know. So I can kind of scratch that off the list, and I know because of uh, you know because of that uh, that that deep uh, valley there, I'm also probably not going to get to see much mirage a lot of days up there. So. So sometimes I stand there and I and I think more about okay what can I cross off the list that's probably not going to be as important today and then I'm left with a list of things kind of by default that that are going to be important. So um, is that how do you, how do you think of stuff like that? So I prefer Mirage. If I can see the Mirage, I'm always going to go for it first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unless it's not working, you know. Right. That's again shooting down here in Houston, Texas. That's where I. Or you know, buy your rifle club. It's always mm -hmm. humid. There's always mirage, yeah. and uh, I always try to go for the mirage. Uh, but at some point, it blows out, and now you're just left with the flags. Right. And <laughs> yeah, so you have yeah. to. And this is where club matches come in. Everybody wants to go to a club match and always win or try right. to win. Well, club matches should be, for example, um, you go to a match and you go, okay, I'm going to read only Mirage, this this entire match. Mm -hmm. Nothing else, only Mirage. And then yep. you shoot the entire match and read only Mirage. That's it. Yep. Don't worry about your score. You're, you're, you're learning the Mirage, right? Yep. And then you go next month or next match and you go, okay, this time I'm only going to read flags. That's it. I'm going to do nothing but flags. And then you only read flags. And, uh, you know, and then you, you know, and the next time you go, well, 
okay whenever it makes no sense looking at flags then i'll look at mirage and then you start to bring them together right and then and i do that it's like if the mirage is not telling me what i need i'm like okay i gotta look at flags but i don't i have a preference but it's not the end all right i i i i sometimes i gotta look at the other but that's what a club match should be for uh work on things that uh that's gonna make your game stronger not necessarily you know i'm gonna I'm really good at reading Mirage, so that means I'm gonna read Mirage all the time. Because then you're not really learning anything. Make the game more difficult than it needs to be in order for you to learn something. I think that's how the match, the club matches should be addressed. And that way when you go to the big stage, it doesn't matter what they throw at you. You've experienced it, you've done it before, and you're ready to go, you know? That's right. I agree wholeheartedly with you and I've done exactly what you're describing, you know, said, Hey, listen, I'm going to practice this skill or that skill. And, you know, to me, Eric, kind of hand in hand with this, that that hits on the difference in practice and training, you know, practice in my mind is, is repetition and, and, and practice is needed. I'm not throwing a stone at either, at either one of these, but training in my mind is like you give the example of going to the match and I'm only going to shoot Mirage today, you know, I've also had matches where I've been and I've and I've told myself I'm going to choose one condition and my goal at this match is to shoot the entire string without touching the sight or touching the scope knob, you know, or or I'm going to hold the entire match on the same position and so I'm going to work very hard to identify the exact same wind condition basically every time I pull the trigger. You know, and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm going to do this and I, and I know that it's going to take me a long time. I'm going to shoot, you know, and it's going to take me a while laying there. I may be the last shooter on the firing line because I'm doing this, but you know, those, those types of, of training things are, uh, are very, very useful to us. I, uh, I think it was my third Texas state championship. I was laying there last string of the day. And I mean, we're all right there. We just tied. We're within one or two points of each other. And, uh, and I'm shooting, and I shot 14, I stopped, because the wind started doing something I didn't recognize, the mirage, right? So I stopped, and I said, I'm gonna stop, and just wait for my condition. Mm -hmm. And I stopped, and I stopped, and then I saw it come back, and I gave it a few seconds for it to settle down and make sure that it was my condition, it wasn't just blowing through, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I said, okay, it's back. So I jumped back in, shot 15, hit a 10, 16 17 18 and now it's building but i'm again more or less are the same and i'm moving with it moving with it moving with it and shot 19 i put shot all right if i burn it just makes for a better video <laughs> so shot 19 it's a 10 or something and i stopped i had one more to go and i stopped because I couldn't recognize the condition anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I stopped and I waited and I waited and I waited. And it finally came back again and I put the last shot in the center, you know? Yeah. And I had people go, how were you able to stop when you only had one more shot to go? Right. You know, you know how it is. Sometimes we're just so anxious just to get it over with. Yep. And I said, well, I, I knew I couldn't give up a single point. And the, men, the minute it... I just had that condition so, like this picture in my head, mm -hmm. that it was a for sure thing. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, you know what, this is not, I'm, I better stop. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to chance it. Uh, so sometimes, like you're talking about, just get a condition and stick with it. That is sometimes so beneficial. Because that, if anything, that gives you a point to jump back in. That's right. And write it. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. I know exactly what you mean. And no, man, I, I agree with you. I agree with you a hundred percent on that. And, uh, and to me, Eric, you know, I, I agree with you that it's hard, you know, it's hard for us to, to take that time to stop, you know, especially when we get late in the string or man, it's late in the day and I'm tired and I'm hot and blah, blah, blah. You know, all those excuses we were talking about, but you know what, when you, when you do that and just like your story right there, you know, when you do that and you see that success, boy, I tell you what, I can lay there and wait next time after I've seen it work out for me just like that. So it, um, so it gives me a lot of confidence when I, when I do those things and they work out well, you know, I, I, I carry that with me a long time. And so that's been a, a lot of encouragement to lay there and wait when I really knew I needed to, you know, so. For sure. 
John, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, I know a lot of people are going to get a lot of good knowledge out of this. I mean, we, I don't think I've talked wind reading. I talked wind reading with Bob Siebold, who is the head coach of the U.S. Rifle Team, mm -hmm. and he learned that from uh, Earl Libertraw. Yeah. Uh, and he said he was just out there shooting one day, and Earl's like, grab a chair and some beers, and let's go sit, uh, sit on the firing line. And, and Earl started teaching him about wind reading. And now Bob is the the head coach for the U.S. rifle team. So obviously Earl knows a thing or two. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, Eric, it's been a great pleasure of mine to be here. I appreciate the invitation again. Thank you. Uh, every time I have a, a, a guest, I ask them to nominate somebody else that they think uh, I should talk to. Because, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I don't want to stay in my own bubble, right? You know, you and I, we know each other, we say hi, but we've never had a conversation like this right. where yeah. I can learn from you and, and maybe you know, my viewers can learn something from you. And uh, uh, so who do you think I should reach out to and say, you know, you need to talk to this person? I got I got somebody with a whole lot of knowledge, and that All is right. Mark Bujan up at uh, Bartline Rifle Barrels. Okay. Mark is a very knowledgeable bench rest shooter. Uh, and, a, and a really just uh, a super resource that we lean on for, uh, for a lot of information, more than just, hey, what twist rate do we need for this barrel we're ordering for this customer or whatever like that. But uh, if you get a chance to get in touch with Mark, uh, he's a very knowledgeable guy, and I'm, I'm, uh, he teaches me something all the time anyway. Well, that's good to know. Thank you very much, Eric. Good talking with you, all as right. always. Take care. All, all right, right, you too. Bye. Tonight I'm feeling me gonna make Tonight